Well, hello there. My name is Ken Griggs, and I'm going to explain to you a whole new world called Phoenix. Now, what is Phoenix? Well, in a nutshell, Phoenix is an acronym, and it stands for the physics of entanglement, networks, and information exchanges. So, in a nutshell, Phoenix is a physics theory that attempts, uh, and remarkably uh, does a good job at, explaining a lot of the things that um, modern physics has been grappling with explaining. <clears throat> now, um, part of the reason why um, I'm wanting to reveal uh, this new way of looking at the universe is because I believe that we're ready, that we're at a point um, in our technological understanding uh, and in our understanding of the universe um, where we're actually ready to embark on this new way of understanding the universe and using this understanding for technologies, for um, various other things. So, um, I'm going to be coming and creating a series of these, um, of these uh, lectures uh, in order to introduce Phoenix to you. Um, and I'm also using this format because it is the 21st century way, you might say, of writing a paper. Um, so, eventually you're going to find papers online about Phoenix coming from me, um, but uh, this is what I would consider a valid alternative way, and in fact perhaps even a better way, of engaging and uh, giving the information out for people to to uh, to understand. So um, what I haven't done is to write this down for you right now. So I'm really coming straight out of here. So Phoenix um, has been an effort uh, for or since the year 1990 um, when the Genesis concept hit me. And the Genesis concept, or how should we call it, the principle of existence is really, of course, the root of Phoenix. And essentially what the, what the uh, principle of existence says is that everything in the universe necessarily needs everything else in the universe in order to exist. Now, it's not as grandiose, per se, as, uh, as it might sound. Um, but it's still a pretty big deal. Okay, so essentially, it's an obvious statement. And the obviousness of the statement is that in order to describe something, you and the something have to interact or else there would be no something to describe. So really, it's almost a statement that Niels Bohr could have um, fashioned. Um, it is a very pragmatic statement. It basically says that the measurable universe is the universe. And if there are things out there that are not measurable, then they are not a part of this universe. So essentially what that means is that there are no hidden variables. There are no things out there that are non-interactive completely. And if they are there, then as far as this theory is concerned, they're unnecessary. They are not even a part of the system of equations because they are unnecessary. They are um, maybe not trivial to some other universe, but they're certainly trivial to this universe. 
And so that's uh, where this, this principle of existence um, really comes from. And again, I'll state it as the, that everything in the universe necessarily needs everything else in the universe in order to exist. Um, and now, what I've done is to take this principle and to translate it into a mathematical form. Um, or, in another way of saying it, to translate it into uh, another um, theoretical structure, uh, or to give it a theoretical structure uh, that embodies the principle at its core. And so the, the simplest theoretical structure to, to really embody this, this concept uh, is a mathematical structure or language called combinatorics. And essentially what combinatorics is, is a math about the relationship between things, whatever those things are. And um, an embodiment of this combinatorics is uh, this idea of networks. So, you know, in a realistic way of looking at it, a network is the association at its minimal level between two things. So these two things, whatever they are, can communicate with each other. Or maybe one can communicate with the other, um, so there's a one-way communication, or, you know, in the opposite. So we, we've got, you know, several ways that these two things might be able to communicate with each other. But in the end, they form a network. And that network is um, basically uh, at the heart um, of my description uh, um, or translation of this principle into a mathematical um, language. And um, another sort of uh, aspect of these networks, uh, I'm calling them, um, is the idea of a complete network. So essentially what a complete network says is that if you have a certain number of nodes, maybe they're computers, um, a complete network basically says that each one of the computers is directly connected to all of the other computers. Um, so in terms of this idea of using nodes, some thing that can both send out a bit of information as well as accept a bit of information, we would basically say that all of the nodes in your network are directly connected to all of the other nodes in your network. And so this is a basic um, um, uh, mathematical way of, of uh, describing this principle of existence. So, um, so that's where Phoenix really starts, using combinatorics um, and, and using um, these um, fully connected um, networks uh, or complete networks. Now, where Phoenix, as a mathematical entity, um, takes a step forward that we haven't seen yet um, in, in the public universe of physics um, is that it asks, how do these nodes communicate with each other in the sense of, um, you know, does one node accept a signal? Um, how many signals is it accepting? How many signals is it letting out? So essentially, we ask the question about information flow along the network. And then we use a subtle trick. Um, and the trick for Phoenix was actually um, first encountered uh, when I was working with Alexander Migdal, um, or at least working under Alexander Migdal, uh, as a junior and a senior um, at Princeton uh, back in the uh, in the 90s. Um, and so uh, what Professor Migdal was working on was um, something called simplicial quantum gravity. And um, in this construction, um, he, uh, or the, the idea, was to break space and time down to a discrete unit um, and then to describe 
the interaction of those discrete units of space and, um, and to redefine general relativity uh, in terms of those discrete units. Um, one might call them the atoms of space. Um, so the technique that um, I uh, learned through, um, through working on his work um, was something called um, a topological or a, top, a topological transformation. So essentially, um, what um, he was able to do was to take his little simplicial units of space and then to translate them into another type of graph, um, a dual graph. And what allowed the graph and the dual graph to actually have an equivalence between them um, was this idea of topology where you would actually have the same topology on the graph and its dual graph. Now, that's a lot of uh, mathematical jargon I understand, but, um, but the consequence here is that one can describe the network in terms of the nodal structures and the, the pathways connecting the nodes, or, and or, one can describe um, simply the information and uh, being circulated on that network through this duality principle. And that was the breakthrough that allowed me to translate this complete graph concept that adheres to the principle of existence into um, another concept that enables us to describe matter. And that was the breakthrough. So, uh, in, in, so in a nutshell, the breakthrough was using a duality or a dual graph that maintains the topology of the original um, complete graph network. Um, and this dual graph that maintains the topology does so um, by converting the nodes into faces, by converting the, um, the processes that connect the nodes of the original complete graph into edges, and then by um, converting the faces that you can find uh, on that network, you know, every three nodes would form a face, um, and translating that into vertices of our, um, of our dual graph. So the dual graph became the central core feature um, for Phoenix. And in point of fact, um, I actually have some, some diagrams that illustrate um, how one creates this duality between the network and this other domain that we're calling a dual graph. Um, so, this is how Phoenix starts. It inherently says that the universe is built only upon the interrelationships between parts of the universe. In other words, it's a relational construct, and it's a bottom-up construct. So we can literally create the universe either node by node or vertex by vertex, depending on which way you want to see it. Do you want to see it in the, the network language, or do you want to see it in the vertex uh, or the dual graph language? Um, now, the reason for using the dual graph uh, feature is because it makes explicit particles. We can immediately see particles or structures that look remarkably similar to the things that we study in particle theory. Now, um, one, of the, one of the rules that emerges when one takes a dual graph from a regular graph, when one makes this conversion, one of the rules that emerges is that all of these vertices that come out, all of those vertices have a core feature to them. And the core feature is that there must exist three things on that vertex. Those things are either what we call loops, where the vertex is in and of itself connected to itself, or arrows, 
where the vertex is sort of not just connected to itself, but it's connected to itself in a negative way. So we just give it a, a, another diagrammatic look and we call it an arrow. You could use colors. You could say that um, the self-connected uh, or the, the positive uh, self-connected nature is blue and the negative self-connected nature is anti-blue or red or something, whatever, some other distinguishing characteristic. But what we've chosen in this theory, or at least what we've chosen in our diagrams, is just to use this, you know, uh, a loop versus an arrow. Um, and also that the vertex can be connected to another vertex. And its connection to another vertex is through an edge. So there are three structures that always have to sit on every vertex, either a loop, an arrow, or an edge that connects that vertex to another vertex. So, you know, I'll just restate it uh, uh, that every vertex is either connected to itself or connected to another vertex. And these two types of connections can have or must all there must always be three types of those connections sitting on uh, on any vertex. Now, where that comes from in the regular uh, network way of looking at it is that every three nodes in a network form um, a single vertex. So, essentially, the the triplicity or uh, the the three connectedness of a vertex is really due to the idea that in its counterpart uh, tr uh, dual duality that you have uh, three uh, nodes that are connected to each other. Um, so I'm gonna uh, stop this video right now